My name is Seth Fulmer. I've gotten to meet a good chunk of you. If you haven't gotten to meet you, me, hi. Um, I'm the intern here this summer at Madison Church of Christ in Brooklyn, Iowa. I always get confused about that one. Um, to start out, I have a question. Have you ever faced a problem that seemed impossible to solve? And I want you all to think through that and think about this, your answer. Now, I have about 20,000 come to mind, ones that I thought were impossible to solve. And about 20,000 more than I think are impossible to solve. Now, in case you haven't been here the last few weeks, we're just going to do a quick recap. See, we started going through the book of Daniel. And we started in Daniel, well, pre-Daniel, talking about the exile, who they are, what's going on, where they're going. We talked about Babylon and what that is and how they conquered the world. And then we went on and Joel talked about Daniel chapter 1, where a group of them, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, or... Ananiah, Mishael, and Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, and Daniel, all decided that they wanted to be set apart from the people of Babylon. So they asked for different food so that they could eat differently than the people, and God provided them with wisdom and power because of it. And then we went on, and Joel started chapter 2, and we talked about how the king had a dream. And they went and he called together his entire group of advisors and they came and they were used to him telling them the dream and they tell him the answer. And this time he looked at them and he said, hey, you tell me the dream and the answer. And they couldn't. And they failed and they faced this problem that's impossible to solve. So then they go to Daniel, and Daniel gets told, hey, uh, because they all failed, you're going to die. You, your friends, guess what? You couldn't tell the dream and interpret it, so you get to die. So Joel walked us through how they prayed together. How Daniel went to his three friends and said, hey, we are going to be put to death. Let us pray to God. And God revealed to David, Daniel what the dream was. But that's where we stopped in chapter 2. And now I get the pleasure of going through with you into the actual interpretation. Supposing this works. All right, we're switching. There we are. So the king asked Daniel, also called Belteshazzar, are you able to tell me what I saw in my dream and to interpret it? Daniel replied, no wise man, enchanter, magician, or diviner can explain to the king the mystery he has asked about. See, Daniel could have made himself famous with this one feat, this impossible task, a task that all the others had failed at. Daniel could have walked up and said, hey, I know the answer. Let me be the guy. I know how to do it. But he doesn't. But there is a God in heaven who reveals mysteries and he has shown King Nebuchadnezzar what will happen in the days to come. Your dream and the visions that pass through your mind 
as you were laying in bed are these. This impossible task. Yet as they're sitting there, Daniel says, hey, I couldn't do it. You asked me if I could interpret the dream, and the answer is I failed too. But there's a God who does. As your majesty was lying there, your mind turned to things to come. And the revealer of mystery showed you what was going to happen. As for me, this mystery has been revealed to me. Not because I have greater wisdom than anyone else alive, but so that your majesty may know the interpretation and that you may understand what went through your mind. Daniel looks at the king and says, you asked me if it was me, and it's not. It was a God in heaven who solved this. And then you asked me if it's because I am greater than your wise men, and still the answer is no. It's not me. Your majesty looked. And there before you stood a large statue, an enormous, dazzling statue, awesome in appearance. The head was made of pure gold, its chest and arms of silver, its belly and thighs of bronze, its legs of iron, its feet partly of iron and partly of baked clay. And you have to imagine the king is sitting there, eyes wide as he looks and he sees that Daniel knows the vision. This dream that has been haunting him. This dream that he set, this thing that only the person who could tell him the dream would then be able to interpret it. And here Daniel starts telling him the dream. This was the dream. And now we will interpret it for you, king. Your majesty, you are king of the kings. The God of heaven has given you dominion and power and might and glory. In your hands he has placed all mankind and the beasts of the field and the birds of the sky. Wherever they live, he has made you ruler over them. And you are the head of gold. Now in my mind, the king is sort of like, yeah, yeah, I am. You acknowledge me as great. Yes, I am. For a traditional greeting to a king would be, may your kingdom rule forever. And to a culture like this, a kingdom was huge. And to acknowledge a king was so great. Now, before we get going a little bit farther, I have to warn you. Before I decided to go into ministry, I was actually going to go be a history professor. So Joel did not corrupt me with maps. I was corrupted a long time ago. So we have the Babylon Empire. Established 626 BCE. An empire that would only last about 80 years, falling in 539 BC. This is the head of gold. Its wealth, its grandeur, its luxury were famous. It was there. And to be Babylonian was to be wealthy. Who wouldn't want that? So come, forget your old ways. We took you in. Now be wealthy. Be wise. Come, fill your cup with great wine. Eat the food. Come, be. And the head of gold was here. 
And the king's sitting there going, yeah, the head of gold. I am the head of gold. Look at my kingdom. But the head of gold dies. After you, another kingdom will arise. Inferior to yours. The Medo Persian Empire. Lasts slightly longer. We get about 220 years. Formed 550 BC, falling 330 BC. Now, silver is less valuable. It is. The glory of the Babylon Empire has fallen. It's taken over. And the Medo Persian Empire was two kingdoms formed together the Medes and the Persians. So that dual nature represented in the arms look, king, this is what will come next. And if I were the king, I'd be getting a little bit scared. You told me that my kingdom's great. Why is it falling? But don't worry. The Medes and Persians fall too. A third kingdom. What a bronze will rule over the whole earth. And we have Greece. I'm sure you've all heard a little bit about that in your time. Alexander the Great conquers the known world. All of it. And when he reached the far east, he cried, for there were no more worlds to conquer. And he came in and he said, hey, look, you want to be Greek? All right, come marry into the Greece population. Come be Greek. Look at our military. We conquered the world. Look at our philosophy. Look at our wealth. It's not as great as Babylon, but it's still and massive. And we all know the story of how that goes. Finally, there will be a fourth kingdom. Strong as iron, for iron breaks and smashes everything. And as iron breaks and smashes everything, so will it crush and break all the others. And we have Rome. The fabulous Pax Romana. Roman peace. A peace held up because of violence. And if you've noticed, Rome's even bigger. Rome conquered even more. And if I'm the king of Babylon, I'm a little bit scared. Sure, I'll be dead, but my legacy will be gone. Not one time over, not two times over, not three, but four. But Rome falls too. Just as you saw the feet and toes were partly baked iron, bark baked clay, and partly iron, so will this be a divided kingdom. Yet, it will have some strength of the iron in it, even as you saw the iron mixed with clay. And the toes were partly iron, partly clay, so the kingdom will be partly strong and partly brittle. And just as you saw the iron mixed with baked clay, so the people will be a mixture and will not remain united any more than iron mixes with clay. So Rome fell and split in half. West Rome, East Rome. Surely these are the great empires that will last for eternity. Right? The West Rome falls in 476 AD. East Rome lasts longer. It lasts till 1453. But then it falls. 
collapses in on itself and is shattered into so many different nations. And we see that again and again and again through history. We see that as everyone comes together, things break and things fall apart and there is nothing. And you, dear king, your majesty are the head of gold who will stand on top of the empire's bowl that will come. And yours will be the greatest, the wealthiest, the one filled with grandeur. But yours is temporary. And another will come, and theirs too will be temporary. And yet another, and yet another, and yet another. And they will continue to rise but they will fall. So some of you are thinking to yourselves, hey, uh, you missed part of it. You skipped some things. While you were watching, the rock was cut out, but not by human hands. It struck the statue at the feet of iron and clay, and it smashed them. Then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, and the gold were all broken into pieces and became like chaff on a threshing floor. The wind sweeping them away without leaving a trace. But the rock that struck the statue became a huge mountain and filled the whole earth. Here's the important part we have to understand about the statue. It's huge. It looks great. But for a person to be able to see it, even in a dream, it's not that big. And for a person to be able to see all the layers in it, be able to tell what they are, it has to be in a set location. This statue, this great kingdom, is not that big. It's over this much of the world. What they would have considered the known world. And it's nothing. So what does this teach us? We've gone through some history. We've seen the rise and falls of empires. What does this teach us? Have you ever thought of a problem you couldn't solve? That was the question I asked at the beginning. We're going back to it. There are a lot of times we like to fill problems with empires. I'm concerned about the state of the United States. Well, if you vote this way, then we will fix the empire. Well, I'm concerned about, well, did you, did you do, take your vitamins? Did you do X? Did you do Y? Did you write it down? Did you call the people you had to call? Did you trust the organization you were supposed to trust? And we fill our lives with empires. I mean, I carry one in my pocket. I carry an empire with me, and I hate it. And if it didn't scream at me, if I got too far away from it, I wouldn't carry it. We fill our lives with empires. We do that politically. 
We do that religiously. We do that with every activity we do. Every choice we make is serving an empire. There's a famous book that once said, you are how you worship. And what you worship isn't always what you are. And what you worship isn't what you think it is sometimes. We worship things. We look at the empire, we want the empire to succeed, and so we like to see the good, but the truth is the empire will fall again and again and again. The longest of those empires lasted little less than a thousand years. We won't be around to see that. So why? Why? It might last our lifetime, but why do we put the faith in the things that will fail? You see, that statue stood in one location. It covered one section of the world, and it crumbled so easily. But what about the thing that crushed it? In the time of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that will never be destroyed, nor will it be left to another people. It will be crushed. It will crush all those kingdoms, and it will bring them to an end. But it will endure forever. This is the meaning of the vision of the rock cut out of a mountain, but not by human hands. A rock that broke the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, and the gold to pieces. This is the kingdom of God. You see, unlike the statue which stood in one location, stood in one location and it was there in a hierarchical system of who's in charge and who's not in charge based off of values of gold and silver. The kingdom of God crushes the empires. And doesn't just sit there in the location that it was. It continues to grow until it becomes a mountain. A mountain that is said to fill the entire earth. The great God has shown the king what will take place in the future. And this dream is true, and its interpretation is trustworthy. The kingdom of God is here. It's true. It's trustworthy. It will never fail. It will never fall. God has not handed off the kingdom of God to anyone and said, hey, I'm leaving, you take care of it. God is here. So what kingdom are you subscribed to? I know there's a lot of times in my own life where it's not the kingdom of God. There's a lot of times where I really like subscribing to the other kingdoms of the world. But the truth of the matter is, what are you serving? What you do 
is what you worship. So what is it you're worshiping? That's a really tough question. But the truth is, I'm really bad at it. But we have a couple of things we can do. We saw earlier in this chapter that Daniel turned to his friends so that they could pray together. There's two right there. Community, together. Praying together. Praying to God. Getting connected with people so that you can walk together. There's this nifty little thing in front of each one of you called a Bible. It's another simple way to learn about the kingdom of God and learn if you are walking in it. So what kingdom are you serving? What kingdom takes up your time, your energy, your resources, and your heart? Please pray with me. Heavenly Father, we are really good at giving the kingdom's power to someone else. God, I pray that you teach us to follow you and to accept your kingdom. For yours is the only one that will not pass away. God, help us to see where we are worshiping other things in our lives and to turn them over to you. In Jesus' name, amen.